Josh Payne from Oklahoma State University. And um, going to be talking about some work that uh, Chad Penn from Oklahoma State University and Josh McGrath from the University of Maryland have conducted. Uh, I tried to get Chad to go to this conference and present it, but he couldn't make it. So uh, that's what happens when you invite someone else. They'll give you their material to present. So that's, that's what I'm going to try to do is present some of his material and then talk about uh, how we're integrating uh, some of the past research that they've done into a current project here in uh, Oklahoma. So we're all aware of the pathways of phosphorus transport, uh, predominantly overland flow. We see very little due to leaching. Um, if you then want to characterize the overland flow aspect and, and what comes out, we're looking basically at particulate phosphorus that, that could be carried on eroded soils. Uh, it's uh, not 100% biologically available. And uh, then the other one that we could characterize it uh, would be dissolved phosphorus, which is a little more of a hurdle to, uh, to prevent. And uh, it's 100% biologically available. Um, as our soil test phosphorus increases in our soil to higher levels, we see obviously a higher potential for phosphorus loss in those soils, which could then reach our waterways. So that, that risk increases as our phosphorus levels go up. A couple of nutrient sensitive watersheds that uh, many of you have probably heard about, Chesapeake Bay for one, and uh, the Illinois River watershed being the second one. Both of them are in a uh, high density poultry producing area. Uh, there's urban development in both areas. Not a lot of cropland to spread the manure or the poultry litter on. And uh, we have water quality concerns in both of these uh, watersheds, which have led to lawsuits, um, regulations, et cetera, over the past uh, couple of decades. Legacy phosphorus are essentially what would be left over even after uh, the cessation of uh, fertilizer applications of phosphorus in our soils. Um, we'll hang around for quite some time. Here we're looking at data spanning from 1994 to 2010 and uh, you know somewhere between 50 to 100 parts per million would be our uh, optimum soil test phosphorus level and this was uh, different phosphorus applications to corn and uh, from spanning from a low application to a high application may like three phosphorus on, on the uh, uh, y-axis and you can see where even after the cessation of fertilizer applications, it takes some time before we see those phosphorus levels start to decline. In fact, they're going to remain in the soil for several years. So how have we managed them in the past? Uh, traditionally, we've managed those with best management practices that, that target the particulate phosphorus. Uh, that's good. You know, if we can reduce the erosion and the sediment uh, getting into the waterways, then that particulate phosphorus can be targeted. Vegetative buffers, riparian areas do work very well for that. And then when we reach high phosphorus soils, limiting phosphorus application on those soils is another tactic uh, to prevent uh, increasing amounts of phosphorus. But what those most, those more traditional BMPs do not target would be your dissolved phosphorus levels. And those dissolved phosphorus levels can be a concern, especially in soils with high phosphorus levels already in them. Um, they're difficult to target, you know. We can't really capture that dissolved phosphorus with a vegetative buffer. And um, our high phosphorus soils will continue to produce dissolved phosphorus for years. Uh, here's a correlation between soil test phosphorus and our runoff phosphorus or our soluble P. So one idea, and, and this uh, I would, you know, uh, present to use a tool in the toolbox would be a phosphorus sorbing material. Uh, basically, that would be any material that can chemically bind and remove dissolved phosphorus from a solution, therefore reducing the dissolved phosphorus that's in your uh, solution. And examples may include aluminum, iron, calcium, magnesium, etc. A lot of these are, are byproducts. So many of these byproducts are, are not used, they're sent to landfills. And so there, there could be some use from these byproducts uh, in sorbing some of this phosphorus. Um, 
one way to look at this, and, and it's been looked at in the past, is basically take this phosphorus sorbing material and you could apply it to soil with high phosphorus levels. You could apply it to manure uh, around feedlots, et cetera. Yes, you would bind the phosphorus, but are you removing it from the system? No. So that may not really be the best approach. So another idea would be to actually treat the runoff uh, water uh, and capture that dissolved phosphorus and, and look at ways to then remove the uh, dissolved phosphorus from the system. So the idea behind this was, uh, was actually quite simple. You take a phosphorus sorbing material and uh, build a structure. Uh, you have high phosphorus water going through the structure. It's sorbing the dissolved phosphorus. You have a drainage layer at the bottom and uh, the water coming out the end has lower phosphorus levels than the water that uh, went into the structure. Different examples of uh, phosphorus sorbing materials could be your acid mine drainage uh, treatment residuals, uh, bauxite mining and production waste, steel slag, which we're going to kind of focus on that one today, drinking water treatment residuals, fly ash, gypsum, foundry sand. Uh, all of those could be examples uh, to take a closer look at. Of course, there's a selection process for determining which of these materials might be most suitable for you. First being availability. Uh, is it available locally? What are the costs for transportation uh, and getting it to, to uh, where you want the product? And looking at potential contaminants, uh, that's obviously important. You don't want to use anything that's going to add additional contaminants or or metals uh, to the waterway. So not all these may work. Sorption characteristics are important as well. Uh, how much phosphorus is being bound up. And then looking at physical properties, hydraulic conductivity uh, weighs in pretty heavily. And, and you're gonna find a balance between your sorption characteristic and your, your uh, physical properties. Uh, something that may have a high sorption characteristic may uh, be very fine material and may not have the best hydraulic conductivity, whereas something that has a great conductivity and allows water to flow through it may not bind as much of the uh, soluble phosphorus. So the advantages of, of such a system would be removing both particulate and dissolved phosphorus because there's actually quite a bit of the sediment that and the particulate phosphorus that gets trapped within the structure. Uh, then having the ability to remove the phosphorus sorbing material uh, from that structure, you also could remove metals, pesticides, and the, the cool aspect about this would be treating hot spots. So essentially, you find a landscape and uh, you determine where the water is, is uh, going to and, and uh, designing that structure in that hot spot and potentially capturing phosphorus from an entire catchment and sp instead of spending you know, costly dollars uh, over the entire uh, landscape to reduce some of the uh, particulate phosphors. So potential applications could include ag runoff and of course uh, urban runoff as well. This is uh, a pilot scale filter at OSU that uh, Chad Penn has worked on. Uh, here we're looking at turf, graph, turf grass plots uh, where we have a retention pond. And so the retention pond has uh, a lot of nutrients in it uh, from uh, runoff uh, in the upper right corner, or uh, your upper left corner, uh, you see a 200 gallon water tank full of steel slag. And what they do is they pump water from uh, this retention pond into that uh, structure. And then they'll basically test different materials and look at the, the amount of phosphorus added and the amount of phosphorus removed and determine which ones have the best uh, characteristics as a, a potential material for use. Uh, Chad actually installed one of these on a golf course in Oklahoma, and uh, this golf course is approximately 150, well, the whole area is approximately 150 acres. You see you have a wooded area, uh, urban development, and then the golf course, and uh, the water uh, flows and collects at this point here, and uh, this was the structure next to a culvert uh, where they actually installed the structure and filled it with steel slag. You can see the, the flow of the water goes through the culvert, uh, through two inch diameter piping, which uh, then allows uh, the water to, uh, to move out through the steel slag uh, 
and uh, down the bottom where it's drained out with a four inch drain. And here's your overflow where uh, this is about nine inches of steel slag, one quarter inch. Uh, we think that uh, we could have used actually smaller steel slag or smaller particle size. And over an eight month period, we're looking at about 25% of the dissolved phosphorus that was uh, removed from that system. Uh, the structures handled flow rates up to uh, 100 gallons per minute. Of course, you can design these structures however uh, you want, whatever size, depending on flow rate, peak flow, annual flow, et cetera. And the cost, uh, of course, as any ag economist, economist would say, it depends. I guess it, it depends on the size of uh, your ditch, uh, peak flow, annual flow, et cetera. Uh, what target phosphorus uh, percentage do you want to reduce? And uh, this structure was somewhere around 2000 bucks, which was mainly tied up in the steel and uh, sieving the steel. Some of the work that uh, Josh McGrath at Maryland has done, it's the same uh, philosophy, same idea. Basically, um, here we're looking at a perforated steel box, and it's filled, uh, filled with steel slag, and it has a pipe inside the box that allows the water from a, a stormwater uh, retention area to uh, flow through the top of the box and uh, go through the piping and then goes uh, through the outflow here. So any water after a heavy rainfall event would go through these. This is a little more portable. Those could be moved uh, or refilled with uh, new steel slag or whatever material you're using. Here's something that's a little more portable. It's easy to install. They're uh, ditch cartridges. Um, the downside would be the limited amount of uh, phosphor-sorbing material that you could actually place inside one of these uh, cartridges. Here's a, a tile-drained filter in a ditch, and uh, it's perforated pipe. Uh, you have uh, phosphor-sorbing material underneath it and over it. Uh, there's a dam at the end, which allows you to control the retention time and uh, release the water. Um, you know, as, as you would like, but the water's going through the pipe. And uh, here's a picture of it after revegetation. There's Josh McGrath in the picture. So what Chad has been doing uh, from the model standpoint is uh, developing a, a lab flow through model, uh, and he's validated it with pilot scale filters, the picture I showed you earlier, testing various materials to determine which ones have the best hydraulic conductivity, the best sorption characteristics, and adding phosphorus at constant rates, uh, varying retention times, and uh, measuring phosphorus outflow. And the idea behind this is to uh, look at your site, determine uh, your peak flow, annual flow, et cetera, and then uh, determine what your phosphorus removal may be for, for that area. Uh, what sorbing material are you going to use and then this model can help you design that parameter as far as uh, how big the structure needs to be, et cetera. Here's just an example of the model uh, predicted versus measured values of phosphorus added and phosphorus removed. And moving this to implementation, uh, there's possible interest in, in uh, commercializing the design. There could be interest in the golf course industry municipalities, uh, ag industry, and uh, potentially NRCS cost share where this could fall under an EQIP program where the, uh, the model could be used um, to uh, look at, at site-specific characteristics and determine the size of the structure and what material that you might use. Of course, if you wanted to look into credit uh, brokering of nutrients, that's a potential as well. With TMDLs uh, coming down the pipeline in the Illinois River watershed, you know, you could look at the various phosphor sources and then determine if uh, nutrient trading uh, would be potential between those sources and, and uh, those that are actually uh, reducing uh, phosphorus inputs with such a system. So with all that said, that's kind of the research that they have done up to this point. Where I've kind of been brought in on this is uh, pretty much the last slide here. Uh, we have an NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant that we were awarded along with the uh, Illinois River Watershed Partnership. And we plan to install this on a uh, poultry operation in the Illinois River. 
uh, watershed. Um, here's a poultry operation with the flow direction. So we have uh, runoff going uh, right by the houses. Uh, and basically we've identified our hot spot that we would like to place the structure. Uh, we plan to uh, implement that and start uh, construction on that within a month or so. Uh, and then we will be monitoring it over time. And uh, we probably will be using steel slag. We're still finalizing the test in the lab as to what PSM we're going to use. And we're looking at a target of maybe 45% dissolve phosphorus reduction. So with that, uh, I'll try to field any questions that you may have. Yeah, the question is, how long would the steel slag last and uh, what will we do after? Those are great questions. In the uh, golf course study, we're looking at 25% um, reduction in eight months, and uh, then he's looking at uh, ways of, of potentially rejuvenate, rejuvenating the, uh, the material, uh, or, you know, you could go and remove it. Uh, ideally, we would like to keep it there for about a year and then remove the material. Um, probably a different structural design, so it's a little easier to get in there with a, a skid steer loader and remove the material. And uh, this is material that would normally be landfilled. So at the very Last resort, you could landfill it. But other options would include, uh, if it's steel slag a quarter of an inch, uh, I believe that could be land applied to a field. You know, uh, It could also be used for road construction. Steel slag is often used in the road construction industry, uh, possible mulch, et cetera. So there are some uses. But again, this is a material that would normally go to a landfill. Yes, sir. What percentage of the flow actually goes through the filter? I guess that depends on how um, good of a design that you have for that, that ditch. Uh, if you are accurately predicting peak flow, uh, hopefully you're, you're capturing most of that. And it also depends on your uh, hydraulic conductivity as well. But uh, we're looking at uh, phosphorus loading and uh, not just a discrete phosphorus. And uh, so... 45% of the cumulative dissolved phosphorus is our target. I think that's the best I could give you. Yes, sir. So, so what are the ramifications? Are there concerns with this phosphorus becoming available? If we were to take the phosphorus sorbing material, land apply it, uh, we're confident that this is, is bound to this phosphorus sorbing material. And uh, of course, uh, if you were properly applying it to the land, uh, managing it well away from streams, et cetera, I wouldn't have a concern with, with slag uh, on a field uh, with a setback away from a stream. But uh, the short answer is it's, it's tightly bound. 